I'm Bradley Robertson. I'm the superintendent of the Oxford School District. Uh, I've been a part of the Oxford School District for 22 out of my 24 years in education. I began uh, my journey in Oxford School District as an educator after graduating from Ole Miss. I did my student teaching at Oxford as well. I worked my way through the system uh, from being a math teacher and assistant coach to the head baseball coach uh, to associate athletic director to assistant principal to high school principal, assistant superintendent, and now I'm in my third year as superintendent of OSD. You know, Oxford has always been a high performing district and well known across the state of Mississippi. So there's this idea of fighting the status quo. Uh, you've probably heard uh, of the saying of fighting good to great, and that's kind of where we were as an organization. Uh, our vision for the Oxford School District is to be bold and innovative and continue improving, but when you're already high performing, uh, sometimes the status quo can be good enough. So it's really about pushing our employees uh, to be better. Uh, to get better at getting better, getting better every day of the journey. Uh, and another significant challenge that we have in the Oxford School District is we have a significant achievement gap. We have a large population of high performing students, but we do have a part of our population that really struggles. And we owe it to them, every single one of them, to do everything that we can in our power uh, to give them the opportunity to be successful after they leave the Oxford School District. And that's really what drives our continuous improvement journey. We are a, a, already a very high performing district, right? So we needed a push. Uh, we needed a different lever uh, to continually get better at what we were doing inside of our systems. You know, we were a completely autonomous system when I be became superintendent, and we needed uh, to be more aligned in our systems. We were operating, uh, in some sense, as hope as being a strategy, uh, simply because we are such a high performing school district and have some very talented kids in our school system and we needed to get away from hope being a strategy and understanding what was working and not working in our system and find ways to improve and that's why I really engaged with student education when I became superintendent of the Oxford School District. It was this idea of systems alignment. There really wasn't a lot of low-hanging fruit of how to improve so we really had to take a deep dive into our systems into our processes and make sure that we were utilizing all of our resources the best way that we possibly could to help every student achieve and achieve at high levels. We started with the establishing the district level scorecard uh, and then moving down to the school level scorecards. You know, my, my student coach Tim and I had lots of conversations about where to start, but I am a guy that uh, loves action uh, and I like to move quickly if possible, and there were several conversations where Tim had to slow me down, <laughs> but because of, of wanting to see action or impact as quickly as possible, we started with the scorecard process. Uh, establishing the district scorecard and the school level scorecards have been a tremendous support for us. You know, if you look back at our employee engagement surveys, you will see the significant impact that that's had, the, de the developing scorecard process has had. Two questions on the survey uh, that we've seen significant gain uh, are around um, students understanding their job expectations as an employee, and then, no, I'm sorry, employees understanding their job expectations as employees, and then also our employees understanding the vision and mission and direction of the Oxford School District. And I think those two answers and the increase on the surveys of those two answers are directly tied to the development of our scorecard process. Uh, and we've seen student achievement gains ever since we started that process as well. Studer Education has been a partner, uh, as well as Tim, our Studer coach. And the reason I've valued that partnership for the last three years is because it, Studer Education uh, is not a partner that always tells you what you want to hear. And that's been incredibly valuable. Uh, and I'm assuming that's the same way all throughout the organization, but I can certainly say that that's how Tim operates. Um, in, in coaching me as a young superintendent in the profession and also coaching us through the improvement process. And that's been invaluable to me. Uh, it, it does create this sense of uh, creative tension uh, inside of our organization that leads us to improvement. It's made us more self-aware of, of, of potholes, of areas of improvement that we've needed to address, uh, and he hasn't sugarcoated those. But I think the, the real value of why that that's acceptable inside of student education and with Tim is because he truly understands that the number one asset that any organization has is its people. And he works incredibly hard to develop that relationship and to make sure that you understand that he is here 
not uh, to necessarily to promote an organization, but he is here to help you improve as an organization because in his heart, it's all about the kids as well. And that's really what I valued um, in my relationship with Tim. Uh, and I will tell you today, is Tim is not only our coach, uh, he is a mentor to me and he is a friend. Uh, so it extends well beyond just being a student coach with Tim. You know, he was a retired superintendent himself for eight years. Uh, and being a, a young superintendent, he's been invaluable to me uh, in helping me grow as the, as the leader that I needed to be. Uh, and, and I can't overstate uh, that enough. We have seen a significant increase in employee engagement across the Oxford School Districts in the last few years. And I believe what's had a significant impact on that has been, one, making sure that we are valuing our people. Uh, empowering your people those that are closest to the work, being problem-focused uh, and user-centered, as what we like to say in the Oxford School District, is how you improve employee engagement. And we were missing some tools, quite honestly, to do that. Rounding has been very impactful across the Oxford School District in getting our staff members more engaged in the in the day-to-day -day actions and the work, um, and feeling valued and feeling important, feeling like they have a part of the decision-making process, feeling that they can change the outcome of students, feeling like they're not siloed in one classroom, expected to be miracle workers, right? But it's this idea of working towards a team approach, working collectively uh, inside of small pockets as schools and inside of a larger organization to see all of our kids succeed. And I would also say again, the district uh, scorecard and schools development scorecard process has been critical in increasing our employee engagement because it has created this sense of I understand what's expected of me. I know the outcomes that you're expecting me to achieve, and I also have a clear understanding of the vision, mission, and direction of the Oxford School District. I would have to give all our school principals uh, the majority of the credit when it comes to listening and responding to their staff members and being responsive to the needs and desires of their staff members. Um, they have utilized rounding perfectly to make sure that staff members have a significant amount of input when it comes to the decision-making process in the Oxford School District. One principal, Misa Presley at Bramlett Elementary School, she's even created a link, uh, a communication link that goes on her weekly um, staff member report that she sends out on Fridays. And the link is just to a simple, a simple form. It's kind of like a, a rounding form in case it's not formalized in a meeting face-to-face -face, that they can offer suggestions about things that aren't working, or things that are working well at Bramlett Elementary, things that may not be working well at Bramlett Elementary. What barriers are you facing? They submit that form. At the end of the week, she takes that form and creates a, a stoplight report about all of the actions that were submitted in the form. And this is a continually improving process that doesn't necessarily require a face-to-face -face meeting, but there's ongoing talk and conversation uh, and using technology to do that about how we can improve Bramlett Elementary School. I just thought that was a neat way to, to incorporate rounding inside, inside of a school setting to where as a face-to-face -face conversation may not always be an available option which I think has been helpful. And honestly, it is a change idea. When we have our scorecard meetings, it is a change idea that I've expressed to other principals. It's one, it's a change idea that she's going to continue to implement at Bramlett, uh, and also one that we will scale to other schools moving forward. So it's improvement science, improvement work at its best. Alignment in the school district is incredibly important. Uh, and why is it important? Uh, it's simple, because without alignment, I believe there will be children that will not have the opportunity to succeed or to be successful. Uh, and we owe it to all children for the opportunity to succeed. We were a primarily an autonomous system before I became superintendent, uh, and we were successful as an autonomous system in, in a lot of ways. Uh, but that autonomous system also led to us having gaps. And where there's gaps, there's students that aren't successful. So it was important for us to bring alignment to our systems in order to make sure that we were giving all children uh, in the Oxford School District, the opportunity to succeed. And I will tell you, that's a difficult process to get alignment. Um, you know, there's some different strategies in how you get to alignment. As I shared with you, we were a majorly a, 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 an autonomous system. You know, some approach is, is to take that autonomy and to slowly take that autonomy away and maybe until the pendulum gets back towards the middle to where you still have systems alignment, um, but there's still some empowerment in your organization as well. 
Uh, but another approach is, is strategically uh, approach that I took, and that was to swing the pendulum as far the other direction as I could uh, and make it a centralized system first. Uh, and through that centralization, now we are beginning to slowly um, provide some autonomy and empowerment back to our staff members and to get the results that we want to get. And people say, well, why did you take that approach? Why did you not just slowly move the pendulum back to the middle from autonomous to being more aligned and skip the part about being completely centralized? I shared with you earlier, every kid, the kids that are sitting in desks right now, deserve the opportunity. So I want the approach that is going to get me to the results the quickest. And there's some conversations out there that moving to a completely centralized system and, and then bringing the pendulum back towards the middle uh, is the fastest approach to getting systems alignment. So that's why that I decided strategically as a superintendent to take that approach. And I think we're beginning to see some results of that. Uh, and we're looking forward to now beginning to open up and to empower our employees even more, those that are closest to the work uh, moving into the 24-25 school year. Evidence-based leadership has been critically important uh, to me as the superintendent and really understanding and digging deep into the model. As you know, the evidence-based leadership model starts with making sure that you have a strategic vision uh, and plan for the work. Uh, and being a data nerd, that's been very helpful to me. Why? Because in digging into the data, uh, I have a clear understanding of what our stakeholders want across our community and we've made uh, a strategic effort in making sure that we understand that through survey data, uh, through some of our um, uh, quantitative data as well and student achievement data and things like that. But digging into the data has also allowed me a clear understanding of exactly what areas we need to improve. And when you talk about improvement work, it's very easy for us to jump at a, at a solution uh, when we're looking at this large problem, something like um, chronic absenteeism or something like uh, in, in our effort or in our case. Oh, um, oh, don't there's do a that. little rustling right when you did that. Yeah, that's because I touched it. Sorry. That's okay. I will do that again. Yeah, now we're good. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> I went, yeah, uh, let me get okay. my train of thought back. What was the question again? Mm, you're um, focusing <clears throat> in on the measures that are most important. EBL is part of yeah. it in the scorecard. And you were talking about when you're dealing with a big problem like chronic absenteeism. Yeah, when you're dealing with large problems like chronic absenteeism or um, an achievement gap, right? It's very important that you really dig deep into the data to understand the root cause of the issue. So digging deep into data is really what's helped us understand some of the root causes of, of how we're falling short as an organization in meeting uh, the needs of some of our most needy students across our organization. And evidence-based leadership and understanding how to utilize data to form a strategic plan and district level scorecards and school level scorecards that really focus on that work uh, has been vital in us changing the narrative for some of our students. The way I like to think about the strategic planning process is the strategic plan is the 30,000 foot view. I think of it as an altitude framework. It's the 30,000 foot view. It gives us uh, the big aims, the vision, the mission, the goals for the organization. Uh, but quite often what happens to strate strategic plans is they sit on a shelf and nothing ever happens, right? The purpose of the strategic plan is to galvanize your community around what really matters. The district level scorecard and the school level scorecards, the PLC action plans and the teacher action plans are really what bring that strategic plan to life, something that I've recently heard from one of our colleagues is this idea of district level scorecards, school level scorecards, and the action plans, keep the data on the table, right? And if you don't keep the data on the table, the actions that really matter tend to fall to the side. There's a great quote in James Clear's book, Atomic Habits, right? He talks about this idea of organizations do not rise to the level of their goals, they fall to the level of their systems. And the reason that quote is so impactful is a strategic plan is full of goals. But if you do not have the actions, the daily actions to help improve or help you meet those goals, the data falls off, on the ta off the table, five years down the line, you're exactly where you started. So that's why the scorecard process and the action uh, plan process is so vital in bringing the strategic plan to life. Being a school district in a university town uh, certainly has its uh, pluses, but it also has its challenges. Um, and the way that I like to describe it is uh, we have very high expectations in the Oxford School District from our community. 
Imagine being a teacher at the high school uh, that is teaching chemistry uh, and the student that is sitting across from you, his father is teaching chemistry at the University of Mississippi. Uh, that raises a level of expectation. You better know what you're talking about. You better be on your P's and Q's. Uh, but it, it requires you to be an expert educator if you want to be a member of the Oxford School District team. Uh, so again, uh, that's both a, both a blessing and a curse. A curse uh, in, in, in one way, but a blessing in that we are required to have high expectations for our students in the Oxford School District, which is, is something that um, we strive to achieve. And I would also say, in being in a university town, we find ourselves pushing further beyond just this idea of academics. You know, we want to create students in the Oxford School District when they leave here that are college, career, and life ready. And we take that very seriously. Just a student leaving here academically proficient um, is not necessarily a student that can be successful in society. So how do we create that student in the Oxford School District is something that we've really been focusing on the last two or three years that I've been superintendent. I think our district services survey results um, are high because one, I have been able to hire quality people, uh, which again is the number one asset that you have in any organization to lead in those roles. You know, it's very easy as a central office to operate as an accountability arm, but the way that we should be off, uh, operating is as an arm of support. And that's a tough balance sometimes. And we don't always get it right. But at, central, at our central office, our cabinet members, our main leaders and our executive team, they do a very good job uh, as being a supportive arm for our building and school leaders. And I think that's easily recognized. Uh, they take the time to be in buildings, to be in schools, to have conversations, not just with principals and assistant principals, but with other staff members, and making sure that we are meeting the needs of across our school system. So I think, you know, the main part of that answer would be, we realize uh, that there is a difference in being an accountability arm in the hierarchy uh, of education, uh, and we understand the value of being a supportive arm uh, in our district office. There's significant research out there that, that talks about the impact that principals have on the success of a, of a school in which they serve or in which they lead. So we're doing ourselves a disservice in organizations or school districts across the country if we're not spending adequate time developing our leaders and making sure that they're prepared to do what they're doing inside of the classroom. And one model that has really been missing, or one component that's really been mis missing in leadership development um, in education has really been about understanding continuous improvement and how to get better at getting better each day inside of a school system. It's been a part of the healthcare world uh, for 50, 60, 70 years, uh, but we haven't instituted that work inside of, of school systems for some odd reason, right? Um, so spending time and making sure our, our staff really understands uh, the crux of continuous improvement and how we develop our leaders has been critical. And I'll give you, for example, one of the main components that we have really instilled inside of our leaders is understanding that continuous improvement is about tending uh, to, to variance inside of your systems. And what is variance? Variance inside of your systems means that you have an achievement gap like we have. It means that uh, there is, you have to look through education through an equitable lens and making sure that you're providing all of your, your students inside of your system, the resources and the support they need in order to be successful. And unless you have developed leaders to look through that lens of improvement, uh, like we're working to, to develop our leaders, you end up with an organization that has both high performing students and a certain population that are low performing, which is where we are. So developing our leaders is the first step. Developing our leaders in the continuous improvement work and looking through that equity lens and looking through the lens of how to get better at better, how to get better at getting better every day has been the first step in our process. It's also why I started with scorecards once again, uh, because scorecards touch the buildings more so than a strategic plan. And I wanted to make sure that our building leaders and their development had a laser focus on measuring what really matters inside of our organization. 
Um, so developing, thinking or developing them in a way to make them think differently. Another major, what I would call hurdle in education and developing leaders is we always look in education through an accountability lens. And there's this fear that's placed on school leaders and there's this fear in classroom teachers when the lens that you always look through is accountability. So how do we reshape that lens inside of our schools to an improvement lens? Well, you have to reshape the lens in the leader first. Um, and I, another huge component of that for us is relationship. School leaders have to trust me as the superintendent, have to trust the district office leadership to be able to look through an improvement lens and not always look through an accountability lens. Uh, and that's been a critical aspect on how we've been able to grow our leaders across the system and also start getting the results that we want to get. You know, when you are trying to build trust inside of your organization, uh, you have to provide space and for it to be okay not to be successful. I, I just had a scorecard meeting just the other day uh, that a principal did not meet a goal on their scorecard. Um, and that was okay because we looked through the action items that the principal um, had put in place in order to help achieve that goal. Uh, and we didn't meet the goal, but you know what we learned? We learned what didn't work. And learning what didn't work is often just as important as learning what does work. Because now we can take those actions and understand that we did them with fidelity, which she was able to say that these actions were implemented with fidelity, that we can take those actions off the list and we can focus our work now on some other change ideas or actions to help us achieve that goal moving forward. So being able to have those open and vulnerable conversations I think is important. Another way that we really built trust with our school leaders is guess who else has a scorecard? I do. And that scorecard is actually my evaluation as the superintendent of the Oxford School District. It's a significant part of my evaluation when I sit down with the board. Uh, so they know that, hey, I, I'm, I'm, in the, I'm in the game with them uh, and, you know, I'm going to do everything that I can to support them and I trust them uh, to do their work. We spent one year developing our, our district level scorecard. Uh, and I talk a lot about our people because our people deserve to be talked about, uh, quite honestly. Um, we did some things to make sure that our, our, our staff members were ready to go on a continuous improvement journey and how we have a better understanding of when they're at that point. And one of those ways is uh, that we identified inside of our system was they began to ask. They began to ask, what is this continuous improvement stuff that you're talking about? Tell me a little bit more about this district level scorecard. What is its purpose? Where is this going? Can we get involved in this work? Um, and again, it goes back to having an organization that's really built around trust and empowering people to do their work. So they wanted to be on board um, with at, at, at their school level because they wanted to support me and they wanted to support our district. Uh, in the vision uh, of moving forward. And that means a lot to me as a district leader to have people uh, that want to impact and help not just our organization but me as their superintendent uh, to do things that are going to make a difference in the lives of kids. Uh, I, the first thing that I would impart on any new superintendent uh, that, is, that is working to move from good to great is the worst thing you can do is nothing. We see organizations that settle for the status quo. It would have been very easy for me to come into this Oxford School District position and already being a high-performing district and just settle for the status quo and do nothing and, and ride out being an A district each and every year uh, until the day that I retired. So I would say in, tr in moving from good to great, the worst thing you can do um, as a new incoming superintendent is to do nothing. The second piece of advice I would give any new, any new superintendent that already is in a high-performing district is to leverage and empower your people. As a superintendent, you think you know all the answers. We're type A leaders. In a lot of cases, it's the reason that we've gotten where we are in sitting in superintendent's chairs. But we don't have all of the answers. And that's what continuous improvement is about. So I would say as quickly as you possibly can, find a way to empower the people that are closest to the work and allow them to do their jobs. 
Um, and we tend to lose focus of that when you become a new superintendent because we're eager. We think we have all of the answers. We think that um, we can stand on this pedestal and move the organization ourselves with all of our own ideas uh, that we have. And we forget sometimes to empower those that are closest to the work. Um, and, and I guess I, and along that same line, I would say be problem focused and be user centered. Again, getting those closest to the work involved. Uh, and